Don Powell, the American Writer Once upon a time, New York City was as delightful a place to live in as to visit. There are many amenities, as they say in brochures. One was something called Broadway, where dozens of plays opened each season and thousands of people came to see them in an area which today resembles downtown Calcutta without, alas, that subcontinental city's deltine charm and intellectual rigor. One evening back there in Once Upon a Time, February 7th, 1957 to be exact, my first play opened at the Booth Theater. Traditionally, the playwright was invisible to the audience. One hit out in a nearby bar, listening to the sweet nasalities of Pat Boone's rendering of Love Letters in the Sand from a glowing jukebox. But when the curtain fell on this particular night, I went into the crowded lobby to collect someone. Overcoat collar high about my face, I moved invisibly through the crowd, or so I thought. Suddenly, a voice boomed, boomed, told across the lobby, Gore! I stopped. Everyone stopped. From the cloakroom, a small round figure, rather like a Civil War cannonball, hurtled toward me and collided. As I looked down into that familiar round face with its snub nose and shining bloodshot eyes, I heard the entire crowd, crowded lobby heard, How could you do this? How could you sell out like this? To Broadway? To commercialism? How could you give up the novel? Give up the security? The security of knowing that every two years there there will be, like clockwork, that (laughs) that $500 advance. 30 years later, the voice still echoes in my mind, and I think fondly of its owner. Our best comic novelist, The Field, I can hear Don Powell's snarl, is not exactly overcrowded. On the night that Visit to a Small Planet opened, Dawn Powell was 59 years old. She had published 14 novels, evenly divided between accounts of her native Midwest, and how the hell to get out of there and to make it in New York, and to make it to New York, in the highly comic New York novel centered on Greenwich Village, where she lived most of her adult life. Some 23 years earlier, the Theater Guild had produced Powell's comedy Jigsaw, one of her many unsuccessful attempts to sell out to commercialism. But there was third act trouble, and despite Spring Byington and Ernest Truex, the play closed after 49 performances. For decades, Don Powell was always just on the verge of ceasing to be a cult and becoming a major religion. But despite the work of each dedicated cultist, as Edmund Wilson and Matthew Josephson, John Dos Passos and Ernest Hemingway, Don Powell never became the popular writer that she ought to have been. In those days, with a bit of luck, a good writer eventually attracted voluntary readers and became popular. Today, of course, popular means bad writing that is widely read, while good writing is that which is taught to involuntary readers. Powell failed on both counts. She needs no interpretation, and in her lifetime she should have been as widely read as, say, Hemingway or the early Fitzgerald or the mid O'Hara, or even the late, far too late, Catherine Ann Porter. But Powell was that unthinkable monster, a witty woman who felt no obligation to make a single, much less a final, down payment on love or the family. She saw life with a bright Petronian neutrality, and every host at life's feast was a potential tremol. Tremalchio to be sent up. In the few interviews that Powell gave, she often mentions as her favorite novel, surprisingly for an American, much less for a woman of her time and place, the Satyricon. This sort of thing was not acceptable then any more than it is now. Descriptions of warm, mature, heterosexual love were, and are, woman's writerly task, and the truly serious writers really heartbreakingly flunked the course while the pop ones passed with bright honors. Although Powell received very little serious critical attention to the extent that there has ever been much in our heavily moralizing culture, when she did get reviewed by a really serious person like Diana Trilling, The Nation, May 29th, 1948, La Trilling warns us that the book at hand is no good because of the discrepancy between the power of mind revealed on every page of her novel. The locusts have no king and the insignificance of the human beings upon which she directs her excellent intelligence. Trilling does acknowledge the formidable intelligence, but because Powell does not deal with morally complex people, full professors at Columbia in Midjourney, the novel as a whole fails to sustain the excitement promised by its best moments. 
Apparently, a novel to be serious must be about very serious, even solemn. People rendered in a very solemn, even serious manner. Wit. What is that? But then we all know that power of mind and intelligence count for as little in the American novel as they do in American life. Fortunately, neither appears with sufficient regularity to distress our solemn middle class middle brows as they as they trudge ever onward to make <laughs> as they trudge ever onward to some Scarsdale of the mind, where the red light blinks and blinks at pier's end, and the fields of the Republic rush forward ever faster like a rug rolling up. Powell herself occasionally betrays bewilderment at the misreading of her work. She is aware, of course, that the American novel is a middle-brow, middle-class middle affair and that the reader-writer must be as one in pompous self-regard. There is so great a premium on dullness, she wrote sadly. Robert Van Gelder, Writers and Writing, New York, Scribner's 1946, that it seems stupid to pass it up. She also remarks that, It is considered jolly and good-humored to point out the oddities of the poor or of the rich. The frailties of millionaires or garbage collectors can be made to seem amusing to persons who are not millionaires or garbage collectors. Their ways of speech, their personal habits, the peculiarities of their thinking are considered fair game. I go outside the rules with myself, with my stuff, because I can't help believing that the middle class is funny too. Well, she was warned by four decades of book chatterers. My favorite was the considered judgment of one Frederick Morton. The New York Times, September 12, 1954. But what appears most fundamentally lacking is the sense of outrage which serves as an engine to even the most sophisticated satirist. Miss Powell does not possess the pure indignation that moves Evelyn Waugh to his absurdities and forced Orwell into his haunting contortions. Her verbal equipment is probably unsurpassed among writers of her genre, but she views the antics of humanity with too surgical a calm. It should be noted that Mr. Morton was the author of the powerful, purely indignant, and phenomenally compassionate novel Asphalt and Desire. In general, Powell's books usually excited this sort of commentary. Waugh, indignant? Orwell, hauntingly contorted? The fact is that Americans have never been able to deal with wit. Wit gives away the scam. Wit blows the cool of, the, of those who are forever expressing a sense of hoped-up outrage. Wit deployed by a man, gee, wit deployed by a woman with surgical, surgical calm is a brutal assault upon nature. That is, man. Add, add is take arms. Finally, as the shadows lengthened across the greensward, Edmund Wilson got around to his old friend in the New Yorker, November 17, 1962. One reason he tells us why Powell has so little appeal to those Americans who read novels is that she does nothing to simulate feminine daydreams, sexist times. The woman reader can find no comfort in identifying herself with Miss Powell's heroines. The women who appear in her stories are likely to be as sordid and absurd as the men. This sexual parody was, is, unusual. But now, closer to the century's end than 1962, Powell's sordid, absurd ladies seem like so many... Madams de Stael, compared to our latter-day viragos. Wilson also noted Powell's originality. Love is not Miss Powell's theme. Her real theme is the provincial in New York who has come from the Middle West and acclimatized herself, himself or herself to the city and made himself a permanent place there without ever, however, losing his fascinated sense of an alien and anar anarchic society. This is very much to the very badly written point. Wilson finds her novels among the most amusing being written, and in this respect, quite on a level with those of Anthony Powell, Evelyn Waugh, and Muriel Spark. Wilson's review was of her last book, The Golden Spur. Three years later, she died. She was dead of breast cancer. Thanks a lot, Bunny. One can hear her mutter as this belated floral wreath came flying through her transom. Summer. Sunday afternoon. Circa 1950. Don Powell's duplex living room at 35th East Knight Street. The hostess presides over an elliptical aquarium filled with gin, a popular drink of the period known as the Martini. In attendance, Kobe, just Kobe to me for years, her cabaliere servant, 
He is neatly turned out in a blue blazer, rosy faced, sleek sil sleek silver hair, combed straight back. Kobe can talk with charm on any subject. The fact that he might be Don's lover has never crossed my mind. They are so old. A handsome young poet lies on the floor, literally at the feet of E.E. E. Cummings and his wife Marion, who ignore him. Don casts an occasional maternal eye in the boy's direction, but the eye is more that of the mother of a cat or a dog, apt to make a nuisance. Conversation flows, gin flows. Marion Cummings is beautiful, so indeed is her husband. His eyes faded a faded dim a faded denim blue. Kobe is in great form. Though often his own subject, he records not boring triumphs, but improbable disasters. He is always broke, and a once distinguished wardrobe is now in the hands of those gay receivers, the landladies, his landladies. This afternoon at home, Dawn is demure, thoughtful. Why? she suddenly asks. Eyes on the long body beside the coffee table. Do they never have floors of their own to sleep on? Cummings explains that as a poet, as the poet lives in Philadelphia, he is too far from his own floor to sleep on it. Not long after, the young poet and I paid a call on the Cummingses. We were greeted at the door by an edgy Marion. I'm afraid you can't come in. Behind her, an unearthly high scream sounded. Dylan Thomas just died, she explained. Is that Mr. Cummings screaming? Asked the poet politely as the, new, as the keening began on an even higher note. No said Marion. This, that is not Mr. Cummings. That is Mrs. Thomas. But for the moment, in my memory, the poet is forever asleep on the floor while on a balcony high up in the second story of Don's living room, a gray, blurred figure appears and stares down at us. Who, I ask, is that? Don gently, lovingly stirs the martini, squints her eyes, says, my husband, I think. It is Joe, isn't it, Kobe? She turns to Kobe, who beams and waves at the gray man who withdraws. Of course it is, says Kobe, looking very fit. I realize at last that this is a menage a trois in Greenwich Village. My martini runs over. To date, the only study of Don Powell is a, doctor a doctoral dissertation by Judith Fay Pett, University of Iowa, 1981. Miss Pett has gathered together a great deal of biographical material for which one is grateful. I am happy to know at last that the amiable Kobe's proper name was Coburn G Gilman, and I am sad to learn that he survived on by only two years. The husband on the balcony was Joseph Gusha, or Gusha, whom she married November 20th, 1920. He was musical, she literary, with a talent for the, for the theater. A son was born retarded. Over the years, as fortune was spent on schools and nurses, to earn the fortune, Powell did every sort of writing, from interviews in the press to stories for ladies' magazines to plays that tended not to be produced to a cycle of novels about the Midwest, followed by a cycle of New York novels, where she came into her own dragging our drab literature screaming behind her. As doyen of the village, she held court in the grill of Lafayette, of the Lafayette Hotel, for Egalia... <laughs> Allegis, the, La the Lafayette was off Washington Square at University Place and 9th Street. Powell also runs like a thread of purest brass through Edmund Wilson's The Thirties. It was closing time in the Lafayette Grill, and Kobe Gilman was being swept out from under the table. Niall Spencer had been stuttering for five minutes, and Don Powell gave him a crack on the jaw and said, Nuts is the word you're groping for. Also, Peggy Bacon told me about Joe Gusha's attacking her one night at a party and trying to tear her clothes off. I suggested that Joe had perhaps simply thought that this was the thing to do in Don's set. She said, yes, he thought it was a social obligation. Powell also said that Powell also said that Dotsie's husband was very much excited because the Prince of Wales was wearing a zipper fly, a big thing in the advertising business. A footnote to this text says that Don Powell, 1897 to 1965, and Wilson carried on a correspondence in which she was Mrs. Humphrey Ward and he a seedy literary man named Wigmore. Later, there is a very muddled passage in which, for reasons not quite clear, James Thurber tells Don Powell that she does not deserve to be in the men's room. That may, be, that may well be what it was all about. I have now read all of Powell's novels and one of the plays. Um, I have omitted an interesting short novel 
because it is not part of the New York cycle. Powell made one trip to Europe after the war. Although Paris was no match for the village, Powell, ever thrifty, uses the city as a background for a young man and woman trapped in a cage for lovers, published the year that Dawn roared at me in the Booth Theater. The girl is a secretary companion to a monster lady, and the young man her chauffeur. The writing is austere. There are few characters. The old lady, Leslie Patterson, keeper of the cage, is truly dreadful in her loving kindness. In a rather uh, not in a rather nice, if perhaps too neat ending, they cage her through her need to dominate. Thus, the weak sometimes prevail. Miss Pet provides bits and pieces from correspondence and diaries and fragments of book chat. Like most writers, Powell wrote of what she knew. Therefore, certain themes recur, while the geography does not vary from that of her actual life. As a child, she and two sisters were shunted about from one of Midwestern farm or small town to another by a farmer, by a far, by a father, who was a salesman on the road. Her mother died when she was six. The maternal grandmother made a great impression on her and predisposed her toward boarding house life as a subject, not a residence. Indomitable old women, full of rage and good jokes, occur in both novel cycles. At twelve, Powell's father remarried, and Dawn and sisters went to live on the stepmother's farm. My stepmother one day burned up all the stories I was writing, a form of discipline I could not endure. With 30 cents earned by picking berries, I ran away, ending up in the home of a kind aunt in Shelby, Ohio. After graduation from the local high school, she worked her way through Lake Erie College for Women in Painesville, Ohio. I once gave a commencement address there and was struck by how red brick New England Victorian the buildings were. I also found out all that I could about their famous alumna. I collected some good stories to tell her, but by the time I got back to New York, she was dead. Powell set out to be a playwright. One play ended up as a movie, while another, Big Night, was done by the group theater in 1933. But it was the First World War, not the theater, that got Powell out of Ohio and to New York in 1918 as a member of the Red Cross. The war ended before her uniform arrived. Powell wrote publicly, married, wrote advertising copy. At the time, Gusha or Gusha was an account executive with the advertising agency. Failure in the theater and need for money at home led to her novel, led her to novel writing and the total security of that $500 advance each of us relied on for so many years. Powell's first novel, Wither, was published in 1925. In 1928, Powell published She Walks in Beauty, which she always maintained mysteriously, was really her first novel. For one thing, the Ohio heroine of Wither is already in New York City, like Powell herself, working as, as a syndicated writer who must turn out 30,000 words a week in order to live, in Powell's case to pay for her child's treatments. In a sense, this New York novel was premature, with her second book, Powell Turns Back to Her Origins in the Western Reserve, where New Englanders had recreated New England in Ohio. And the tone is dour, is dour Yankee with most un-Yankee-ish wit. The Ohio cycle begins with She Walks in Beauty, which is dedicated to her husband, Joe. The story is set in Powell's youth before the First World War. The book was written in 1927. Popular writers of the day, Thornton Wilder, had published the Bridge of San Luis Rey in the same year as Powell's first but really second novel. Louis Bromfield received the Pulitzer Prize for Early Autumn, a favorite Bromfield phrase, candy pink and poison green, occasionally surfaces in Powell. While Cather's Death Comes for the Archbishop was also published in 1927. The year 1925, of course, had been the most remarkable in our literary history. After, comm after commemorating Life in the Midwest, Sinclair Lewis brought his hero Aerosmith to New York City, a pattern Powell was to appropriate in her Ohio cycle. Also in, in that miraculous year alongside, as it were, Wither, Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, Dos Passos's Manhattan Transfer, Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. It is interesting that Dreiser, Lewis, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Dos Passos, and the popular Bromfield were all like Powell, Midwesterners with a dream of some other great good place, preferably Paris, but Long Island Sound and social climbing would do. Powell briskly shows us the town of Birchfield, 
Dory is the dreamy, plain, bright sister, always contrasting two sisters in these early novels. She stands in for Powell. Linda is the vain, chilly one. Aunt, Ju Aunt Jewel keeps a boarding house. The Powell old lady makes her debut. She pinned her muslin gown at the throat, dropped her teeth with a cheerful little click in the glass of water on the table, and turned out the, ga turned out the gas. The cheerful launches us on the Powell site style. The story is negligible. Who's going to make it out of the sticks first? In the boarding house, there is an old man who reads Greek. His son has already made it to the big city where he is writing a trilogy. Powell doesn't quite see the fun in, of this yet, but Dory falls for the young man. Dory, with that absurd infantile tilt to her nose, Don Twitty. Also, Dory's tact is very like her creators, a theatrical couple of a certain age are at the boarding house. The actress Laura tries on a hat. It will look wonderful on Linda, Dory vouchsafed pleasantly. It's too young for you, Aunt Laura. The adverb pleasantly helps make the joke, a point of contention between no adverbs, Bram Greene and myself. I look to the adverb for surprise. Green thinks that the verb should do all the work. Dory observes her fellow townspeople nicely. He had been such a shy little boy, but the shyness had settled into surliness, and the dreaminess was, sh was sheer stupidity. Phil Lancer was growing up to be a good Birchfield citizen. Points of view shift wildly in Powell's early books. We are in Linda's mind, as she is about to allow a yokel to marry her. Later on, Linda thought, after they were married, she could tell him she didn't like to be kissed. The book ends with Dory still dreaming that the trilogist will come and take her off to New York. In 1929 came The Bride's House. One suspects that Powell's own wit was the result of being obliged for so long to sing for her supper in so many strange surroundings. Lotta's children arrived, three gray, horrid-looking little creatures, and their names were Lois, Vera, and Custer. We've come to stay, they shouted. We've come to stay on the farm with Uncle Stephen and Aunt Cecily. Aren't you glad? No one is, alas, but the, these children are well-armored egotists. She tells lies. Lois hissed in George's ear. I'm the pretty one, and she's the bright one. She told the conductor we lived in the White House. She's a very bad girl, and Mother and I can't do a thing with her. Everything she says is a, is a lie. Cousin Sophie, except when it hurts your feelings, then it's true. A child after... After absolutely no one's heart. Unfortunately, Powell loses interest in the children. Instead, we are told the story of Sophie's love for two men. The grandmother character makes a dutiful appearance, and the Powell stock company go rather mechanically through their paces. Powell wants to say something original about love, but cannot get the focus right. A woman needed two lovers, she finally decides, one to comfort her for the torment the other has the other caused her. This is to be a recurring theme throughout Powell's work and presumably life. Kobe versus Joe? Or was it Kobe and Joe? Dance Night, 1930, is the grittiest, most proletarian of the novels. There are no artists or would-be artists in Lamptown. Instead, there is a railroad junction, a factory, a bon ton hat shop, where the protagonists, a mother and son, live close to Bill Delaney's saloon and billiard par parlor. Like the country, the town has undergone the glorious 1920s boom. Now the depression has begun to hit. Powell charts the fortunes of the mother Milner, milliner, Elsinore Abbott, and her adolescent son, Maury. Elsinore's husband is a traveling salesman. He affects jealousy of his wife, who has made a go of her shop, but given up on her life. Maury gets caught up in the local real estate boom. He also gets involved with a waif, Jen, from an orphanage, who has been adopted by the saloon keeper as a sort of indentured slave. Jen dreams of liberating her younger sister, Lil, from the home where her, their mother had deposited them. Jen is not much of an optimist. People last such a little while with me. There's no way to keep them, I guess. That's why I've got to go back for Lil, because I know how terrible it is to be left always. Never see people again. It took Powell a long time to work all this out of her system. Happily, farce intrudes. A young swain in a romantic moment slid his hand along her arm biceps and pressed a knuckle in her armpit. That's the vein to tap when you embalm people, he said, for he was going to be an undertaker. The highest work for a Lamptown girl is a is telephone operator, then waitress, then factory hand. Powell has a Balzacian... 
precision about these things, and she remembers to put the price tag on everything. Money is always a character in her novels, as it was in Balzac's. In fact, Powell makes several references to Balzac in her early books, as well as to his uh, Eugenie Grandet. Maury grew up, and his mother hardly notices him. She had moved over for Maury as she would move over for someone on a streetcar, certain that the intimacy was only for a few minutes, but now it was 18 years, and she thought, why Maury was hers, her, hers more than anything else in the world was. This revelation shatters no earth for her or for him, and one can see how distressing such realism must have been, as it still is, for American worshippers of the family. Love, too. Maury gets involved with a builder who indulges him in his dreams to create handsome houses for a public that only wants small look-alike boxes jammed together. Meanwhile, he loves Jen's sister, Lil, while Jen loves him, a usual state of affairs. The only bit of drama, indeed melodrama, is the return of Maury's father. There is a drunken fight between father and son, then a row between father and Elsinore, whom he accuses wrongly of philandering. Finally, wearing down her barriers, she reaches for a pistol. This was one way to shut out words. She raised the gun, closed her eyes, and fired. Although everyone knows that she killed her husband, the town chooses to believe it was suicide and life goes on. So does Maury, who now realizes that he must go away. There'd be no place that trains went that he wouldn't go. In 1932, Powell published The Tenth Moon. This is somewhat Catharesque novel composed with a fugue-like series of short themes. The influence of her ex-music critic husband... Connie Benjamin is a village bovary, mad married to a cobbler with two daughters. Uh, she once dreamed of becoming a singer. Connie lives now without friends or indeed a life of any kind in a family that has not the art of communication with one another. Connie daydreams through life while her daughters fret. They went to bed at 10 but whispered until 12, remembering through all their confidences to tell each other nothing for they were sisters. The husband works in amiable silence. Finally, Connie decides to have a social life. She invites to supper her daughter's English teacher. She also invites the music teacher, Blaine Decker, an exquisite bachelor, as adrift as Connie and dreams of a career in music that might have been. Powell now introduces one of her major themes, the failed artist who, with luck, might have been what? In dreams, these characters are always on stage. In life, they are always in the audience. But Blaine has actually been to Paris with his friend, a glamorous one-shot novelist star Donald Glenway Westcott. Blaine and Connie compliment and, and compliment each other. Compliment and compliment each other. Connie realizes that she has been utterly, completely, hideously unhappy for 15 years of marriage. Yet each pretends that there are compensations to village life and poverty. Isn't it better, I've often thought, she said, for me to be here keeping up with my interest in music, keeping my ideals, than to have failed as an opera singer and been trapped into cheap musical, musical comedy work? To hear them tell it, they are as one in the contentment of failure. But Blaine still hears his mother's voice from off stage, a Powell-esque killer. I sometimes wonder, Blaine, if I didn't empath empath emphasize the artistic too much in your childhood, encouraging you and perhaps forcing you beyond your real capacity in music. It was only because you did so poorly in school, dear. Powell always knows just how much salt a wound re requires. Although the dreamers talked of music until the careers they once planned <coughs> were the careers they actually had... Okay. Although the dreamers talked of music until the careers they once planned were the careers they actually had but given up for the simple joys of living, knowing success would have destroyed us. Connie goes too far. First, she tries indeed to sing and for an instant captures whatever it was she thought that she had and promptly hemorrhages, tuberculosis. Second, she confides to Blaine that she lost a career home virginity to Tony the Daredevil, a circus acrobat who abandoned her in, Ex in Atlantic City where the kindly cobbler met and married her. He needed a wife. She could not go home. Blaine is made furious by the truth. Then daughter Helen runs off with the boy, and the dying Connie pursues her. 
she finds that Helen has not only managed to get herself a job with a theatrical stock company, but she is about to drop the boy. And Connie knew almost for a certainty that Helen would climb the heights she herself had only glimpsed. Connie goes home to die, and Powell shifts to the dying woman's point of view. When Dr. Arnold's face flashed on the mirror, she thought, this must be the way one dies. People collect on a mirror like dust, and something rushes through your mind, emptying all the drawers and shelves to see if you're leaving anything behind. What a pity, she thought. No one will ever know these are my last thoughts. That Dr. Arnold's mouth was so small. At the end of at the end, Connie has spared nothing, including the knowledge that her husband never believed that she came of a good family and studied music and only fell once from grace with an acrobat. Blaine goes off to Paris as a tour guide. With the story of a country boy, 1934, she ends the Ohio cycle. This is the most invented of the novels. There is no pretty sister, no would-be artist, no flight from village to city. Instead, Powell tells the story of a conventional young man, a country boy, who becomes a great success in business. Then he fails and goes home to the country, no wiser than before. Ironically, Powell is doing the exact reverse in her own life, putting down deep, lifelong roots in that village called Greenwich, far from her own origins. In a sense, this book is a goodbye to all that. Again, one gets the boom and bust of the 20s and early 30s. Chris Bennett is the all-American boy who makes good. He is entirely self-confident and sublimely unaware of any limitations. Yet in due course, he fails, largely because he lacks imagination. There is a good deal of Warren Harding, Ohio's favorite son in his makeup. He is more striking in appearance than reality. Also, Powell was becoming more and more fascinated by the element of chance in life, as demonstrated by Harding's incredible election, those were simple times, to the pres presidency. Chris could not remember ever being unsure of himself except in, the little, in little details of social life, where his defects were a source of pride rather than chagrin. He also wonders if pure luck had brought him success, his success. He has right to wonder. It has. When he finally looks down from the heights, he falls. No fatal flaw, just vertigo. A splendid new character has joined the stock company, a former U.S. senator who sees in Chris a sort of handsome mediocrity that properly exploited could be presidential. John J. Habeman's drunken soliloquies are glorious. Tell them I died for Graustark, said the senator in a faraway voice. He somberly cracked peanuts and ate them, casting the shells lightly aside with infinite grace. What wondrous life this is, I lead. Ripe apples drop about my head. Powell also developed an essayistic technique to frame her scenes. A chapter will begin with a diversion. In the utter stillness before dawn, a rat carpentered the rafters, a nest of field mice seduced by unknown applause into coloratura ambitions, squeaked and squealed with amateur intensity. Here at daybreak, a host of blackbirds were now meeting to decide upon a sun, and also to blackball from membership in the committee, a red-winged blackbird. Unfortunately, her main character is too schematic to interest her or the reader. In any case, except for one final experiment, she has got Ohio out of her system. She has begun to write more carefully, and the essays make nice point counterpoint to the theatricality of her scene writing. The theater is indeed the place for her first New York invention, Jigsaw, 1934, a comedy. The gags are generally very good, but the plotting is a bit frantic. Claire is a charming lady whose 18-year-old daughter Julie comes to stay with her in a Manhattan flat. Claire has a lover and a best woman friend to make the sharper jokes. Julie is a very well brought up young lady. Easy to, easy to see, she has not been exposed to home life. Again, it takes two to make a mate. It takes two women to make your marriage a success to which Claire's lover, Dell, responds, have it your way. Then Claire and I have made a success of my marriage to Margaret. A young man, Nathan, enters the story. Both mother and daughter want him. Julie proves to be more ruthless than Claire. Julie moves in on Nathan and announces their coming marriage to the press. He is appalled. He prefers her mother. But Julie is steel. I can make something of you, Nate, something marvelous. When he tries to talk her out of the marriage, she declares, I expect to go through life making sacrifices for you, dear, giving up my career for you. 
When he points out that she has never had a career, she rises to even greater heights. I know, that's what makes it all the more of a sacrifice. I've never had a career I never will have, because I love you so much. Nate is trapped. Claire wonders if she should now marry Dell, but he advises against it. You're the triangular type, with a bit of the sort of look that so fascinated Powell by its absence in most lives, she might have had a successful commercial career in the theater. But that luck never came her way in life, as opposed to imagination. Finally, Powell's bad luck on Broadway was to be our literature's game. The New York cycle begins with Turn Magic Wheel, 1936, dedicated to Dwight Fisk, a sub-coward nightclub performer for whom Powell wrote special material. Powell now writes about a writer, always in edgy business. Dennis Orphan is a male surrogate for Powell, Powell herself. He is involved with two women, of course. He is also on the scene for good. He reappears in almost all her books, and it is he who writes Finney to The Golden Spur, some 20 years later as the Lafayette Hotel is being torn down and he realizes that his world has gone for good. But in 1936, Dennis is eager on the make, fascinated by others. His urgent need to know what they were knowing, see, hear, feel what they were sensing for a brief moment to be them. He is consumed by a curiosity about others, which time has a pleasant way of entirely sating. Corinne is the profane love, a married woman. Effie is the sacred love, the abandoned wife of a famous writer called Andrew Kell Kellingham, Hemingway's first appearance in Powell's work. Effie is a keeper of the flame. She pretends that Andrew will come back. Why must she be noble? Fra frail sh Frail shoulders, squared to defeat, gaily confessing that life was difficult, but that was the way things were. Dennis publishes a Roman Clef, whose key unlocks Callingham Hemingway story, and he worries that Effie may feel herself betrayed because Dennis completely dispels her illusion that the great man will return to her. As Dennis makes his New York New York rounds, the Brevort Cafe, Long Champs. Luchow's, he encounters Oki, the ubiquitous man about town who will reappear in the New York novels, a part of their Balzacian, Bal, yeah, Balzacian detail. Oki edits an entertainment guide magazine, writes a column, knows everyone, and brings everyone together. A party is going on at all hours in different parts of the town, and Powell's characters are always on the move, and the lines of their extramarital affairs cross and recross. The essays now grow thoughtful, and there are inner soliloquies. Walter miss B now, but sometimes he thought it was more fun talking to Corinne about how he loved B than really being with B, for B never seemed to want to be alone with him. She was always asking everyone else to join them. In fact, the affair from her point of view was just loads of fun, and that was all. She never, she never cried or talked about divorce or any of the normal things. She had... She just had a fine time as if it wasn't serious at all. Powell is much more is much concerned with how people probably ought to behave, but somehow never do. The drinking is copious. Corinne went into the ladies' room and made up again. It was always fun making up after a few pernods because they made your face freeze, so it was like painting a statue. Of course, Walter was as mad as could be, watching the cunning little figure in the leopard coat and green beret patter out of the room. Whenever cunning or gaily or tinkling is used, Powell is stalking dinner with the precision of a saber-toothed tiger. She also notes that those long patient talks, the patient civilized talks that, if one knew it, are the end of love. There are amusing incidents rather than a plot of, that, of the sort that popular novels required in those days. Effie is hurt by Orphan's portrayal of her marriage in this book. Corinne's, Corinne vacillates between husband and lover. The current Mrs. Callingham goes into the hospital to die of cancer. There are publishers who live in awe of book reviewers with names like Gannett Hansen Patterson. One young publisher was so brilliant that he could tell in advance that in the years 1934 to 35 and 36, a book would be called Exquisitely Well Written if it began... The boxcar swung out of the yards. Pip rolled over in the straw. He scratched himself where the straw itched him. Finally, the book's real protagonist is a city. In the quiet of three o'clock, the forties looked dingy, deserted, incredibly 19th century with the dim lamps and dreary doorways. In these midnight hours, the streets were possessed by their ancient parasites. 
low tumble-down frame rooming houses with cheap little shops, though by day such remnants of another de decade retreated obscurely between flamboyant hotels. That city is now well is now well and truly gone. Fleetingly, Effie thought of a new system of obituaries in which the lives recorded were criticized, mistaken steps pointed out, structure condemned, better paths suggested. This is the essence of Don Powell, the fantastic flight from the mundane that can then lead to a thousand con conversational variations. And the best of her prose is like the best conversation where no escalier is ever wit's receptacle. As a result, she is at her best with The Party, but then most novels of this epoch were assembled around The Party, where the characters proceeded to interact with the unsayable gets said. Powell has a continuing hostess, who is a variation on Peggy Guggenheim, collecting artists for a gallery and bed. There is also a minor hostess, a minor hostess, Interested only in celebrities and meaningful conversation. She quizzes Dennis. Now let's talk, she commanded playfully. Powell's adverbs are often anesthetic prep preparatory for surgery. We're never, okay. We're never really had a nice talk, have we, Dennis? Tell me how you came to write. I suppose you had to make money, so you just started writing, didn't you? Cowingham himself comes to the party. Powell's affection for the real Hemingway did not entirely obscure his defects, particularly as viewed by an ex-wife, Effie, who discovers to her relief there was no Andy left. He had been wiped out by Callingham. The success was as so many men before him had been wiped out by the thing they represented. Effie frees herself from him and settles back into contented triangularity with Dennis and Corinne. Cake had ingested too. In 1938, with The Happy Island, the Powell novel grows more crowded and the party is bigger and, wild and wilder. This time, the rustic who arrives in the city is not a young woman, but a young man. Powell is often more at home with crude masculine protagonists, suspecting, perhaps, that her kind of tough realis realism might cause resentment among those who think of women as the fair sex. A would-be playwright, Jeff Abbott, related to Maury, arrives on the bus from Silver City. A manager has accepted his play with the ominous telegram, casting complete, third act needs rewriting, like that of Jigsaw, come immediately. Jeff has two friends in the city. One is Prudence Bly, a successful nightclub singer. The other is Dahl, a gentleman party giver and fancier of young men. At the book's end, Dahl gives great offense by dying, seated in, the, in a chair at his own party. How like him, the guests mutter. Prudence is the most carefully examined of Powell's women. She is successful, she drinks too much, she is seldom involved with fewer than two men. But it is the relationships between women that make Powell's novels so funny and original. Jean Nelson, a beautiful dummy, is Prudence's best friend. Each needs the other to dislike. At the novel's beginning, Jean has acquired Prudence's lover, Steve. The two girls meet for a, ser for a serious drunken chat over lunch. You aren't jealous of me, are you, Prudence? Jealous? Jealous? Good God, Jane, you must think this is the Middle Ages. Prudence then broods to herself. Why do I lunch with women anyway? We always end up sniveling over men in life, and we always tell something that makes us afraid of each other for weeks to come. Women take too much out of, out of you. They drink too much and too earnestly. They drink the way they used to do china painting and cruel work and wood burning. In the restaurant, things grow blurred. You're so good to everyone, sighed Jean. You really are. Nothing could have enraged Prudence more or been more untrue. Finally, Jean goes, Prudence looked meditatively after Jean as she wove her way earnestly through tables and knees. The girl did look like a goddess, but the trouble was she walked like one too, as if her legs had been too long wound in a flag. Prudence's forebears include, yet again, the eccentric grandmother. This one is rich, and Prudence was always glad her grandmother had been neither kind nor affectionate. The escape from Silver City had been easy. The grandmother was indifferent to everyone, including her surly young Swedish chauffeur. The great traveler, Mrs. Bly, always wanted to buy one dinner with two plates, as if he were a Pekingese, and more alarming still, to take one room in the hotels where they stayed. 
After all, she explained, she always slept with her clothes on, so there was nothing indecent about it. In it. In addition, Mrs. Bly is a sincere liar who believes that she was on the Titanic when it sunk and was courted by the Tsar. Jeff Abbott and Prudence meet. They have an affair. Jeff is sublimely humor humorless, which intrigues Prudence. He is also a man of destiny, doomed to greatness in the theater. I never yet found anything to laugh at in this world, said Jeff. You never heard of a great man with a sense of humor, did you? Humor's an, an anesthetic. <laughs> That's all. Laughing gas while your guts are jerked out. Since they are not made for each other, marriage is a real possibility. Prudence is growing unsure of herself. She could not find the place where the little girl from Ohio, the ambitious, industrious little village girl, merged into the evening journal... Uh, evening Journal, Prudence Bly, The Town and the Country Bly. There were queer moments between personalities, moments such as the hermit crab must have scuttling from one stolen shell to the next one. Prudence Bly was not so much a person as a conspiracy. Then Powell, in a quick scuttle, briefly inhabits her own shell. Prudence slew with a neat epithet, crippled with a true word, then seeing the devastation about her and her enemies growing, grew frightened of, a re of revenge, backed desperately, and eventually found the white flag of sentimentality as her salvation. For every ruinous mot, she had a terror for motherhood. A tear for motherhood. The failure of Jeff's powerful play does not disturb him, and Prudence is somewhat odd since worldly success is the only thing that makes the island happy. But he belongs to the baffling group of, the, of competent writers who, needs, who need no applause. For them, the success is not a surprise, but ca cause for wonder that it is less than international. A failure proves a man is too good for his times. When he says he wants to buy a farm in the Midwest and settle down and write, Prudence is astonished. When he does exactly that, she goes with him. Integrity at last. No more glamour, no more happy island, only fields, a man, a woman. In no time at all, she is climbing the walls and heading back to New York, where she belongs. Since Jean has to go let go of Steve, he receives her amiably, but then hardly anyone has noticed her departure. The book ends with Prudence, Prudence's looks, Steve reflected with some surprise, were quite gone. She really looked as hard as nails, but then so did most women eventually. That excellent worldly novelist Thackeray never made it never made it to so high a ground. Angels on Toast, 1940. War has begun to darken the skyline, but the turning wheel's magic is undiminished for E.B., a commercial artist whose mother is in the great line of Powell's eccentrics. E.B. lives with another working woman, Honey, who was a virgin, at least you couldn't prove she wasn't, and was as proud as Punch of it. You would have thought it was something that had been in the family for generations. But E.B. and Honey need each other to talk at, and, and in a tavern, where all Henry used to go, they'd sit in the dark-smoked wood booth, drinking old fashions, and telling each other things they certainly wish they later they had never told and bragging about their families, sometimes making them hot stuff socially back home, the next time making them romantically on the wrong side of the tracks. The family must have been on wheels back in the Middle West, whizzing back and forth across tracks is a mere word from the New York daughters. Brooding over the novel is the downtown hotel Ellery. For $17 a week, E.B.'s mother, Mrs. Vane, lives in contented, genteel squalor. Bar and Grill. It was the tavern entrance to a somewhat medieval-looking hotel whose time and soot blackened facade was frittered with fire escapes. Its dark oak wainscoting rising high to meet grimy black walls. Its ship windows covered with heavy pumpkin chintz. chintz. Once you were in for no more... <laughs> Once in... You were in for no mere moment. The elderly lady residents of the hotel were, without too much obvious haste, taking their places in the grill room, nodding and smiling to the waitresses, carrying their knitting in a slender volume of some English bard, anything to prop against their first Manhattan, as they sipped their drinks and dipped into literature. It was, it was sip and dip, sip and dip, until cocktail time was proclaimed by the arrival of the little cocktail sausage wagon. In its remoteness, the world before television could just as easily be that of St. Ronan's Well. 
It is also satisfying that in these New York novels, the city that was that was plays so pervasive a role. This sort of hotel, meticulously described, evokes lost time in a way that the novel's bumptious contemporary early talking movies don't. Another curious thing about these small, venerable, respectable hotels, there seemed to be no there seemed no appeal here to the average newcomer. Bar and Grill, for instance, appealed to seemingly genteel widows and spinsters, spinsters of small incomes. Then there were those tire tired flashes in the pan, the one-shot celebrities, and on the other hand, there was a gay younger group whose loyalty to the bar and grill were, was based on the cheapness of its martinis. Over their simple dollar lunches, four martinis and a sandwich, this livelier set snickered at the older residents. E.B. wants to take her mother away from all this so that they can live together in Connecticut. Mrs. Vane would rather die. She prefers to lecture the bar on poetry. There is also a plot, two men in business with wives. One has an affair with E.B. There is a boom in real estate, then a bust. By now, Powell has mastered her own method. The essay beginnings to chapters work smartly. In the dead of night, wives talk to their husbands. In the dark, they talked and talked while the clock on the bureau ticked to sleep away. And the last streetcars clanged off on distant streets to remoter suburbs, where in new houses bursting with mortgages and the latest conveniences, wives talked in the dark and talked and talked. The prose is now less easygoing, and there was a conscious tightening of the language, although to the end Powell thought one thing was different than another, while always proving not her metal, but metal. Powell is generally happiest in the bar and grill or at the Lafayette or Brevort, but in A Time to be Born, 1942, she takes a sudden social leap and lands atop the town's social Rockies. Class is the most difficult subject for American writers to deal with, as it, it is the most difficult for the English to avoid. There are many reasons. First, since the Depression, the owners of the Great Republic prefer not to be known to the public at large. Celebrities of the sort that delight Powell fill the newspapers with the great personages are seldom, if ever mentioned. They are also rarely to be seen in those places for public and celebrities go to mingle. Where, I asked, the oldest of my waiter acquaintances at the plaza, we've known each other for 40 years. Have the nobles gone? He looked sad. I'm told they have their own islands now. Things. He was vague like that. As I read my way through Powell, I noted how few names she actually drop, does drop. There is a single reference to the late Helen Astor, which comes as a, as a mild shock. Otherwise, the references are no more arcane than Rockefeller equals money, but then John D. had hired the first press agent. In a sense, Midwesterners were the least class conscious of Americans during the first half of the 20th century, and those who came from the small towns, Hemingway, Dreiser, Powell herself, ignore those drawing rooms where Henry James was at home amongst pure essences, whose source of wealth is never known, but whose knowledge of what others know is all that matters. Powell agreeably knows exactly how much money everyone makes, not enough, and what everything costs, too much. As for value, she does her best with love, but suspects the times are permanently in inflationary for that overhyped commodity. Powell never gets to Newport, Rhode Island in her books, but man she manages Cape Cod nicely. She inclines to the boozy meritocracy of the theater and publishing in the art world, both commercial and whatever it is that 57th Street was and is. But in a time to be born, she takes on the highest level of the meritocracy, the almost nobles, in the form of a powerful publisher and his high-powered wife, based rather casually on Mr. and Mrs. Henry Luce. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. At last, Powell will have a fling at those seriously important people Diana Trilling felt that she was not up to writing about. But since one person is pretty much like another, all are as one in art, which alone makes the difference. Humble E.B. is neither more nor less meaningful than famous Amanda. It's what's made of them in art. Powell does have a good deal of fun with Julian and Amanda Evans and the self-important grandeur of their lives. But Powell has no real interest in power, or more to this particular point, in those whose lives are devoted to power over others. Powell is with the victims. The result is that the marginal characters work rather better than the principals. 
one never quite believes that Julian owns and operates 16 newspapers. One does believe Vicki Haven, who comes from the same Ohio town as Amanda, authoress of a Forever Amber bestseller that has been written for her by the best pen persons and scholar squirrels that Julian's money can buy. Ken Saunders, a reasonably failed hack, gets Powell full attention. He is a friend of Dennis Orphan, who makes an obligatory obligatory appearance or two does or two as does the great novelist Andrew Callingham, still hugely at large. Powell sets a time magazine to be born, in that time not be born, the rising war in the West. This was a time when the true signs of war were the lavish plumage of the women. Fifth Avenue dress shops and the finer restaurants were filled with these vanguards of war. Look at the jewels, the rare pelts, the gaudy birds on elaborate hairdress, and know that war was here. Already the women had inherited the earth. The ominous smell of gunpowder was matched by a rising cloud of Schiaparelli's shocking. The women were once more armed, and their happy voices sang of destruction to come. This was a time when the art artists, the intellectuals, sat in cafes and, and in country homes and accused each other over their brandies or their California vintages of traitorous tendencies. This was a time for them to band together in mutual antagonism, a time to bury the professional hatchet, if possible, in each other. On 5th Avenue and 55th Street, hundreds waited for a man on a hotel window ledge to jump. Hundreds waited with craning necks and thirsty faces as if this single person's final gesture would solve the riddle of the world. Civilization stood on a ledge, and in the tension of waiting, it was a relief to have one little man jump. I know of no one else who has got so well the essence of that first war year before we all went away to the best years of no one's life. Again, the lines of love and power cross and recross as they do in novels and often, too, in life. Since Julian publishes newspapers and magazines and now propaganda for England, much of it written in his wife's name, there is a Sarit-esque suspicion of language in Powell's is reflections. A publisher remarks, a fact changes into a lie the instant it hits print. But he does not stop there. It's not print, it's the word, he declares, the spoken word true, too. This lie forms as soon as the breath of thought hits air. You hear your own words and say, that's not what I mean. Powell is drawing close to the mystery of literature, life's quirky, quirkish reflection. Amanda's power world does not convince quite as much as the village life of Vicky and Ken and Dennis Orphan. Earlier readers will be happy to know that cute Corinne has considered leaving her husband for Dennis Orphan for two or three years and during her delay. The husband had divorced her, with Corinne still confused by this turn of events. She wanted a little more time to consider marrying Dennis. When in doubt, do nothing, is the powerless strategy for life. Ken goes back and forth between Amanda and Vicky. For a time, Amanda is all-conquering. She knew exactly what she wanted from life, which was, in every word, everything. She had a genuine distaste for sexual intimacy, but there were so many things to be gained by trading on sex, and she thought so little of the process that she itched to use it as currency once again. This time with the great writer hun Hunter Kellingham, as it is, ironically, she gets knocked up by Ken and falls out with Julian, but she is never not practical. On the subject of writing, she believes that the tragedy of the Attic poets, Keats, Shelley, Burns, was not that they died young, but that they were obliged by poverty to do all their writing. Amanda's descendants are still very much with us. Sweet lasses still sadden at the thought of those too poor to hire someone who will burn with a bright, clear flame as he writes their books for them. It is plain that Powell was never entirely pleased with the Ohio cycle. She had a tendency to tell the same story over and over again. Trying out new angles, new points of view, even very occasionally new characters. Finally, in mid-war, she made one last attempt to get Ohio and herself right. My home is far away, 1944, is lapidary, at least compared to the, to the loose early works. New York has polished her style. The essays glitter convincingly. The rural family is called Willard, a Civil War veteran for a grandfather. Missing the odd eye, limb. Two sisters again, Lena the pretty one, Marcia the bright one. Powell again holds up the mirror to her past. The uncanniness of Marcia's memory was not an endearing trait. 
Invariably, guests drew respectfully away from the little freak and warmed all the more to the pretty, unaffected normalcy of little Lena. The book begins when father, mother, daughters leave a contented home. Suddenly, there is a nightmare vision. A man in a balloon floats across a starry sky. Home is now forever far away. Too clever by more than half and too much obliged throughout a peripatetic childhood to sing for a supper prepared by tone-deaf strangers, Powell hammered on the comic mask and wore it to the end. But when the dying mother has a horrendous vision of the man in the balloon, the mask blinks for the last time. Aunt Lois has a boarding house. The girls work. The old ladies are more than ever devastating. A grandmother doesn't like children any more than a mother does, she declared. Sometimes she's just too old to get out of tending them, that's all, but I'm not. Lena goes first. The marshal leaves town as Powell leaves town and catches that train which will go everywhere on earth that is not home. On a foggy pane of glass, she writes with her finger, Marcia Willard, Don Powell. After the ward, Powell returned to New York to the New York cycle for good. She published a book of short stories, Sunday, Monday, and Always, 1952. These are occasional ill-omened visits back home, but no longer does she describe the escape. She has escaped for good. There are some nice cosmic moments. Edna, a successful actress, comes home to find her rustic family absorbed in radio soap operas. Although she is quite willing to describe her exciting life, the family outmaneuvers her. Well, Edna, cackled Aunt Meg, hugging, hugging her, I declare I wouldn't have known you. Well, you can't live that life and not have it, so they tell me. The they tell me is masterful. Powell's ear for the cadences of real life talk only improved with time. The final New York novels, The Locusts Have No King, 1948, The Wicked Pavilion, 1954, and The Golden Spur, 1962, demonstrate Powell's ultimate mastery of the subject of subject art itself where the last two are near perfect in execution the locusts have no king yet they all of them go forth by bands proverbs share some of the helter skelterness of the early books it is as if before powell enters her almost benign prospero phase she wants to cut loose once more at the party this time the literary scene of the 40s gets it the protagonist, Frederick Oliver, is a young man of integrity, a $500 advanced man, and literary distinction and not much will. He has been having an affair with Lyle, part of a married team of writers. Lyle is all taste and charm, but Frederick Oliver meets Dodo in a bar. Dodo is deeply unrepenting, unrepentantly vulgar and self-absorbed. She says, Poo on you, and talks baby talk, always a sign for Powell of Lilithian evil. They meet in one of Powell's best bars downtown off Rubber Leg Square, as she calls it. The habu hab habitues, H A B I T U E S, all know one another in that context and often no other. Parallel lives that are contiguous only in the con confines of a cozy bar. Frederick takes Dodo to a publisher's party. Our friend Dennis is there, and Dodo manages to appall. Lyle is hurt. Everyone is slightly fraudulent. A publisher who respects Frederick's integrity, integrity offers him the editorship of Haw, a low publication which, of course, Frederick makes a success of. Lyle writes her husband's plays. There is a literary man who talks constantly of Jane Austen, whom he may not have read and teaches at the League for Cultural Foundations, a.k.a. The New, the New School, where classes bulged with middle-aged students anxious to get an idea of what it would be like to have an idea. <laughs> but under the usual bright mendacities of Happy Island life, certain relationships work themselves out. The most Powell-esque is between two commercial artists, Caroline and Lorna. Ever since their marriages had exploded. Caroline and Lorna had been in each other's confidence, sharing a bottle of a bottle of an evening in Lorna's studio or Caroline's penthouse. In fact, they had been telling each other everything for so many years over their cuffs that they'd never heard a word each other had said. In an ecstasy of female bonding, they discussed their lost husbands. They told each other of their years of fidelity, and each lamented the curse of being a one-man woman. Men always took advantage of their virtue, and Caroline agreed with Lorna that, honestly, if it could be done over again, she'd sleep with every man who came along instead of wasting loyalty on one undeserving male. 
Amen. After a few drinks, Caroline finally said she had slept with maybe 40 or 50 men, but only because she was so desperately unhappy. Lorna said she didn't blame anyone in Caroline's domestic situation for doing just that, and many times she and many times wished she had not been such a loyal sap about George. But except for a few vacation trips and sometimes being betrayed by alcohol, she had never she had really never well, anyway, she didn't blame anyone. Revelations bombard deaf ears. Frequently, they lost interest in dinner once they had descended below the bottle's label, and then a remarkable inspiration would come to open a second bottle and repeat the revelations they had been repeating for years to glazed eyes and deaf ears. Finally, both ladies talked in confidence of their frustrations in the quest for love, but the truth was they had gotten all they wanted out of that all they wanted of the commodity and had no intention of making sacrifice of comfort for a few cupid feathers. Powell was a marvelous sharp antidote for the deep, warm, sincere love novels of that period. Today she is, at the least, a bright counterpoint to our lost and found literary ladies. Powell's deals, Powell deals again with the always to her mysterious element of luck in people's careers. When one thinks of her own bad luck, the puzzlement has a certain poignancy but she can be very funny indeed about the admiration that mediocrity evokes on that happy island where it has never been possible to be too phony. Yet when Frederick, free of his bondage to Dodo, returns to Lyle, the note is el elegiac. In a world of destruction, one must hold fast to whatever fragments of love are left, for sometimes a mosaic can be more beautiful than an unbroken pattern. We all tended to write this sort of thing immediately after Hiroshima, Mona Sesson. The Wicked Pavilion, 1954, is the Café Julien, is the Lafayette Hotel of real life. The title is from the Creevy Papers and refers to the Prince Regent's Brighton Pavilion, where the glamorous and louche wait upon a mad royal. Dennis Orphan opens and closes the book in his by now familiar, familiarly mysterious way. He takes no real part in the plot. He is simply still there, watching the not-so-magic wheel turn as the happy island grows sad. For him, as for Powell, the cafe is central to his life. Here he writes, sees friends, observes the Vanity Fair. Powell has now become masterful in her setting of scenes. The essays, preludes, overtures are both witty and sadly wise. She has also got the number to Eisenhower's American, as she brings together in this penultimate route of all sorts of earlier figures now grown old. Oki is still a knowing man about town and author of the definitive works of the, on the painter Marius. Andy Callingham is still a world-famous novelist, serene in his uncontagious self-love. And the Peggy Guggenheim figure is back again as Cynthia, an art gallery owner and party giver. One plot is young love, Rick and Eleonora, who met at the Café Julian in wartime and never got enough of it or of each other or of the happy island. A secondary plot gives considerable pleasure, even though Powell lifted it from a movie of the day called Holy Matrimony 1943, with Monty Woolley and Gracie Fields, from Arnold Bennett's novel Buried Alive. The plot that Powell took is an old one. A painter bored with life or whatever decides to play dead. The value of his pictures promptly goes so high that he is tempted to keep on painting after death. Naturally, sooner or later, he will give himself away. Marys paints a building that had not been built before his death. But only two old painter friends have noticed this, and they keep his secret for the excellent reason that one of them is busy turning out Marius' pictures, too. Marius continues happily as a sacred presence, enjoying in death the success that he never had in life. Being dead has spoiled me, he observes. It should be noted that the painting for this novel's cover was done by Powell's old friend Reginald Marsh. A new variation on the Powell young woman is Jerry, a clean-cut, straightforward, and on the make. But her peculiar wholesomeness does not inspire men to give her presence yet. The simple truth was that with her increasingly expensive taste, she really could not afford to work. As for settling for the safety of marriage, that seemed the final defeat, synonymous in Jerry's mind with asking for the last rites. An aristocratic lady, Elsie, tries unsuccessfully to launch her. Elsie's brother, Wharton, and sister-in-law, Nita, are fine comic emblems of respectable marriage. 
In fact, Wharton is one of Powell's truly great and original monsters, quite able to hold his own with Peck and Peck Sniff. Wharton had such a terrific reputation for efficiency that many friends swore that the reason his nose changed colors before your very eyes was because of an elaborate Rimbaud color code, indicating varied reactions to his surroundings. Ah, what a stroke of genius it had been for him to have found Nita. How happy he had been on his honeymoon and for years afterward basking in the safety of Nita's childish, childish innocence where his intellectual shortcomings, sexual coldness, and caprices, indeed his basic ignorance, would not be discovered. He was well aware that many men of his quixotic moods preferred young boys, but he dreaded to expose his inexperience to one of his own sex, and after certain cautious experiments realized that his anemic lusts were canceled by his overpowering fear of gossip. Against the flattering background of Nina's delectable purity, he blossomed forth as the all-around he-man, the husband who knows everything. He soon taught her that snuggling, hand-holding, and similar affectionate demonstrations were kittenish and vulgar. He had read somewhere, however, that breathing into a woman's ear or scratching her at the nape of her neck drove her into complete ecstasy. In due course, Nita bore him four daughters, a sort of door prize for each time he attended. The party is given by Cynthia now, and it rather resembles Proust's last roundup. There are people here who have been dead 20 years. Someone observes, including that the boar that walks like a man. There is a sense of closing time. People settle for what they can get. We get sick of our clinging vines, he thought, but the day comes when we suspect that the vines are all that hold our rotting branches together. Dennis Orphan at the end records in his journal that the last moments of the Wicked Pavilion as it falls to the Wrecker's Ball. It must be that the Julian was all that these people really liked about each other. For now, when they chance across each other in the street, they look through each other, unrecognizing, or cross the street quickly with the vague feeling that here was someone identified with unhappy memories. Unhappy memories. As if the other was responsible for the fall of the Julian. What had been a stage for more than half a century to a world was gone, and those who had been bound by it fell apart like straws when the bailing cord is cut and remembered each other's name and face as part of a dream that would never come back. In 1962, Powell published her last and perhaps most appealing novel, The Golden Spur. Again, the protagonist is male. In this case, a young man from Silver City, Ohio, again, called Jonathan Jameson. He has come to, to the city to find his father. Apparently, 26 years earlier, his mother, Connie, had a brief fling with a famous man in the village. Pregnant, she came home and married a Mr. Jameson. The book opens with a vigorous description of Wanamaker's department store being torn down. Powell is now rather exuberant about the physical destruction of her city. She wrote this last book in her mid-60s, when time was doing the same to her. There is no longer a dentist orphan on the scene. Presumably, he lies buried beneath whatever glass and cement horror replaced the Lafayette. But there are still a few watering holes from the 20s, and one of them is the Golden Spur, where Connie mingled with the Bohemians. Jonathan stays at the Hotel de Long, which sounds like the Vanderbilt, a star of many of Powell's narratives. Jonathan, armed with the Connie's cryptic diary, has a number of names that might be helpful. One of that is Claire Van Orphan, related to Dennis, a moderately successful writer for whom Connie did some typing. Claire now lives embalmed in pastime. She vaguely recalls Connie, who had been recommended to her by the one love of her life, Major Wedburn, whose funeral occurs the day Jonathan arrives at the DeLong. Claire gives Jonathan impossible leads. Meanwhile... His presence has rejuvenated her. She proposes to her twin sister, B that they live together and gets a firm no. The old nostalgia burned down long ago for the worldly B. On the other hand, Claire's career is revived with the help of a professionally failed writer who gets eight bucks for 1,500 words of new criticism in a little magazine or 40 for 600 words of old criticism in the Sunday book selection section. He studies all of Claire's ladies' magazine's short stories of yesteryear. He then reverses the moral angle. In the old days, the career girl who supported the family was the heroine, and the idle wife was the baddie, Claire said gleefully, and now it's the other way around. In the soap operas, the career girl is the baddie, the wife is the goody, because she's better for business. Well, you were right. CBS has bought two stories you fixed, and Hollywood is interested. Powell herself was writing television plays in the age of Eisenhower and no doubt had made this astonishing discovery of her own. Jonathan is promptly picked up by two girls at the Golden Spur. He moves in with them. 
Since he has most dom more domestic than they, he works around the house. He is occasionally put to work in bed until he decides that he doesn't want to keep on being a diaphragm tester. Among his possible fathers is Alvine Harshaw, Elias Andrew Kellingham, Elias Ernest Hemingway. Alvine is lonely. You lost one set of friends with each marriage, another when it dissolved, getting smaller and smaller batches each time you traded in a wife. Alvine has no clear memory of Connie, but toys with the idea of having grown a grown son, as does a famous painter named Hugh Gow. Another candidate is a distinguished lawyer, George Terrence, whose actress daughter, unknown to him, is having an affair with Jonathan. Terence is very much school of the awful Wharton of the Wicked Pavilion, only Terence has made the mistake of picking up a young actor in the King Cole bar of the St. Regis Hotel. The actor is now blithely blackmailing him in a series of letters worthy of his contemporary pal Joey. Terence welcomes the idea of, of a son, but Jonathan shies away. He does not want his affair with a daughter to be incestuous. Finally, Cassie, the Peggy Guggenheim character, makes her appearance and the party assembles for the last time. There are nice period touches. Girls from Bennington are everywhere. While Cassie herself was 43, well, all right, 48, if you're going to count every lost weekend, and Hugh Gow's betrayal had happened at birthday time, when she was frightened enough by the half-century mark reaching out for her before she'd even begun to have proper quota of love, her proper quota of love. Cassie takes a fancy to Jonathan and hires him to work at her gallery. He has now figured out not only his paternity, but his maternity, and best of all, himself. The father was Major Wedburn, who was, of course, exactly like the exactly like the boar that his mother, Connie, married. The foster father appears on the scene, and there is recognition of this, if not resolution. As for Connie, she had slept with everyone who asked her because... She wanted to be whatever anybody expected her to be because she never knew what she was herself. Jonathan concludes, that's the way I am. At an art gallery, he says, I have a career of other people's talents. The quest is over, identity fixed, the party over. Jonathan joins Hugh Gow in his cab. He was very glad that Hugh Gow had turned back downtown, perhaps to the spur, where they could begin all over. On that blithe note, Powell's life and life work end and the wheel stops, the magic's gone, except for the novels of Don Powell, all of them long since out of print, just as her name has been erased from that perpetually foggy pain, American literature. The New York Review of Books, November 5th, 1987.